Welcome back to Questing Beast, I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at the Sepulchre of Seven. This is an OSR adventure for character levels five through seven, and it's designed for the old school essentials system, although of course it can be compatible with pretty much any OSR system, and written by Hexano. Uh, one thing to point out right at the start is that the PDF of this adventure is free. I'll put links to that in the description below as usual, um, but you can also get the print version. Let's look at the back cover here. Never meet forgotten heroes. Long ago, a half-elf, half-deer centaur named Jane led a small gorilla band against the armies of an evil fey witch. They prevailed at terrible cost. Over centuries, the church erased all memory of Jane's fey nature. Monsters moved into her hideout-turned-sepulcher, still haunted by Jane's enemies and companions, and a ghost longing to complete his vengeance. In this 39-room dungeon, adventurers will discover the fates and true faces of Jane and her unremembered companions. Will they get out with forgotten riches or become the latest victims of a century-old tragedy? Before we check out what's inside, though, a quick shout-out to today's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Into the AM and their series of fantasy and sci-fi-themed t-shirts. One of their brand new designs is one that I'm wearing right now. It's very D&D themed. It's got that skeletal Lich King sitting upon his throne. I think it would work very well if you were the dungeon master and you wanted something a little bit spooky to wear to your next game. The shirts are very comfortable and they're very affordable too. Right now they have a deal where for $60, you can get three t-shirts in a bundle. And if you use my link in the description below, you can get an additional 10% off the entire web store. Thanks again to Into the AM for sponsoring. Now let's get back to the show. Right near the beginning of the book, we get two pretty excellent maps. This one is created by Dyson Logos. This one is done by another cartographer, although they blend together very well. Uh, it's a two-level dungeon, and there's lots of uh, there's a good key right here on the front, so you can pretty easily figure out what most of the rooms are. I like to advocate for putting the descriptions of rooms right on the map, but I mean this is close enough. It's pretty easy to figure that out for yourself. Uh, there's a good amount of uh, exploration that you can do. When I first looked at it, it seemed at first that there wasn't a lot of you know loops. There wasn't a lot of uh, jacquazing going on there. But when I examined it a bit further, there is actually quite a bit. It's mostly done through secret doors, though. So, for example, you could go through here and loop around through here. There's a secret door there to take you back through there. Uh, there's a secret door over here that loops you around through there. So you've got to be observant, and you're, you're going to find all sorts of interesting uh, routes through this, uh, through this dungeon. Uh, one thing that we're also going to see as we go through it is that the secret doors are actually pretty well done. Uh, they usually have clues pointing to their existence so that a clever player who is examining their surroundings is going to be able to figure out, probably, that there is a secret door there. There are some notes here on the document formatting, and it is a very well-designed book. It uh, reminds me a lot of the official adventures for Old School Essentials, although this is a third-party product. Um, items marked with an asterisk in the room descriptions are developed below. Uh, letters appear next to area titles. So whenever you see the title of a room, you might have an M for a monster, an S for a secret, or a T for a trap, sometimes all three. So that gives you a very quick overview of what's going to be in there. And there is no read-aloud text, which I appreciate. There is a referee's background here, which goes into the whole history of what's uh, gone on inside this dungeon, how it got to be the way that it is today, including a big cast of characters with this whole relationship map here. Now, the first time that I read this, I found it to be kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of characters here, and there's a lot of uh, rather detailed back history that explains uh, how things have ended up the way that they are. However, what ha happened is that as I read through the dungeon after this point, and th those NPCs got more fleshed out through your encounters with them, I then flipped back to this section, and that reminded me how they were connected to the other NPCs, and it was pretty useful. So I wouldn't worry too much if you are initially overwhelmed by this. You're probably going to have to do two read-throughs of this dungeon to get the full sense of it, uh, not because that it's uh, badly designed, but because it is just complex. There's a lot to it. Players can get a somewhat abbreviated background. They ask around at nearby villages. The locals can tell them a little bit of the back history here, how there was this um, centaur um, character who led a rebellion against a fey invasion of the mortal realm. A lot of this sounds a little bit like Dolmenwood, so it's probably a good um, adventure that you could drop into Dolmenwood. There's some similarities to Winter's Daughter. Um, and then she is now entombed in this uh, sepulcher along with her companions. Um, and you can obviously trying to get treasure there, but it's also haunted by all sorts of horrible things as well. There's a lot of different rumors you can get here, most of them false or only partially true, and plenty of hooks that you can pick up as well. Um, for example, Brother John Forrest has been tasked to clean and bless the derelict sanctuary of St. Jane. Sheepish but curious to learn more about the saint's life, he seeks an escort. 
As with a lot of old school essentials adventures, there is a big list of all of the treasure right here near the front of the book, which is really, really nice, including what areas you can find that in. This also includes the total monetary value, so you can figure out the total amount of XP that players could be able to drag out of this thing. There are encounter details for some of the more complex encounters. Constantine Kodiak, uh, the blue amber golem, who's actually a wizard that has implanted his mind inside this creature. The wizard himself is frozen in a amber chrysalis somewhere in the dungeon. You also have things like uh, Rain Dream Gust, the silent ghost. This is a ghost that wanders around and can possess NPCs or PCs, causing all sorts of havoc. And Broken Souls, a fractured psyches, anguished spirits glimpsed through flickering ghostly splinters of shattered mirrors, swirling spectral shards, people-shaped kaleidoscope columns. So these are different spirits that have been trapped and tortured here, and they can show up. They oftentimes don't attack, they just cause um, problems. For example, you always have to roll on this reaction table. They might attack with fury, but oftentimes they're just shell-shocked and lamenting, they plead to be avenged, or they might attack and grab you to, and implore you to end their torment. I thought it was a little unusual that there wasn't a standard random encounter table here, despite having some of these encounter descriptions. Turns out that that is at the end of the book. So if you flip all the way back here, I suppose that makes it easier to flip to. You have this encounter table and uh, it is a little bit involved. It's not just a simple table because it, what you're gonna roll on here is gonna vary depending on how much of the dungeon you've explored and what parts of it are open. So for example, if uh, level one, is uh, if you're on level one and if all portcullises to the grove are closed, you're gonna roll a d12, so just this section. Whereas uh, if, you're on, if you've been to level one and two and the grove and the stairs to level two are opened, you're gonna roll a d30. You can roll different parts of this depending on those different options. So that's a little bit of a, something to keep track of, but it is really well laid out here. That's gonna be a common theme throughout this uh, adventure. It is quite involved, it's very detailed. If you have the kind of players that love to poke and prod, and look in all of the cupboards and poke under all of the beds, they're probably gonna really like this because there's a lot of detail to each of those rooms. Um, but it is really well designed as well and laid out so that finding that stuff is not gonna be too much of a problem. Uh, it is just more detailed than your standard OSR adventure. And I kind of like that. We start off with a map of the nearby area with half mile hexes here. So you could plop this into another hex map if you'd like to, along with different events and encounters as you approach the sepulcher and we get right into level one. Now, as we go through this, there are some little mini maps that you can find that help uh, describe what some of the rooms look like, but a lot of the descriptions don't have those mini maps uh, on the page, which I think would have been really nice. Since it is fairly complex, and as I was reading this, I would have to keep flipping back to the front map to figure out where exactly am I, and how is this, this place related to nearby rooms. Now, I've noticed that in um, official OSC adventures, they've started putting more mini maps on the pages, and I would like to see that continue. The actual entrance to the sepulchre is a hidden door, but there is some very obvious footsteps leading to it, taking the party straight there. You have a kobold complex right at the start of the adventure. They've taken over the beginning of the map, and you have to f find your way through here. There's lots of these little uh, arrow slits and there's a whole separate little network of tunnels around this section of the dungeon. So as you're exploring this area, the kobolds can be sneaking around behind the scenes, firing arrows at you, which is pretty nasty. Like I said, this is a pretty good mini map right here. Uh, there's plenty of ways that you can negotiate with the kobolds. For example, they need food, and there's a whole little mini game or a little table here that you can use to figure out how the negotiations go. The more food that you give you, that you plan to give them rather, and the more uh, kobolds that you've already killed, the more likely they are going to be to negotiate. There are plenty of really great magic items scattered throughout this dungeon. For example, the Potion of Loud Thought. Uh, the character loudly says everything that they think for 2d6 turns. That's really great. If you can find a way to sneak that into the drink of an NPC you want to hear more from, then you certainly will. There's some traps that are like honey traps, these uh, gooey substance on the floor that you can get stuck to that's highly flammable and will cause uh, smoke to fill the area. There's false doors, there's unskillful frescoes that you can slowly put back together to learn more of the background of the dungeon. There's a whole bunch of living statues, that's another common motif that you will find in this dungeon, that were probably, I think, uh, elves that were uh, twisted and mutated and imprisoned in stone by this uh, particular wizard who's one of the companions. So the centaur who led these companions to defeat the Fae, well, it turns out that a lot of those companions were awful people, and in one way or another. Some of them weren't so bad, some of them turned out to be pretty twisted, and you'll slowly figure that out as things go on. 
that maybe your heroes, you weren't meant to meet your heroes, as it says uh, on the back of the book. You can find the actual tomb of this wizard where he's imprisoned in glowing blue amber. His mind is currently in this uh, little cat-like creature that is running around the uh, dungeon and which can possibly help you or hurt you depending on your actions. We have a hall of loyal retainers where there's lots of skeletons in all of these little niches. There's also, I think, four different secret doors in here, which, as I said before, are pretty easy to find if you are looking for them and uh, if you follow those clues. For example, there's a hidden door here, a stone panel swinging freely, likely a cat flap, like a cat flap, not very well adjusted, easy to spot. Or there's one over here, signs of wearing on the door from a frequently opened door wearing on the floor, rather, from a frequently opened door. A new wall is mounted in the front of the ancient door. The alcove is five feet less deep than the others. So I would probably tell that to the players right away because they would notice that, and then they can try and figure things out from there. If the players try and open this secret door over here, skeletons start coming to life and attacking. There's two more sarcophagi here, the one for the beekeeper, who is a halfling, I believe, and Jane the centaur, who is the leader of the companions. All of them get pretty detailed write-ups. We have a derelict guards room. There's levers and hallways. There's plenty of things for players to mess around with and tweak. Lots of different levers here. And as you pull them up and down, you can raise and lower different portcullises, which is actually going to change the uh, configuration of the random encounters, which ones are going to be possible or not. So players are going to have a good deal of control over that by playing carefully. One really interesting character that you can find is Judge Seedeck who is a dwarf mummy, and he's a judge, so that he uh, wants you to help uh, him pass judgment on some characters that have possibly killed him. However, if you dig into the uh, background of this dungeon a bit more, you can figure out that he, in fact, killed someone else unknowingly, probably while being possessed by one of the other companions. Once he figures this out, he will feel so remorseful that he will need to be judged, and you can actually have a trial for him where you can uh, judge him and see if he was actually culpable or not. There's an otherworldly grove here where the world of fairy is slowly intruding upon the mortal world, a little bit like what we saw in uh, Winter's Daughter. I like that theme. It's interesting to see it come up more than once. Uh, there is kind of an overpass right here. You can see how this passage goes above the uh, forest down below. So it's interesting to see uh, maps where that happens, where there's some verticality right there. There's some rules for what's happening in fairy. Time is moving faster there, and that can affect uh, certain things. There's a bunch of different denizens here. We have relationship maps. The author of this book does a really great job just mapping things out visually, including relationships, to make things as easy as possible for the DM to run. I really appreciate that. So much work went into this. It's kind of amazing that it is, uh, the PDF at least, is free. The artwork is a nice combination of what appears to be public domain artwork and original artwork. For example, we have this dryad right here, which I think is drawn over a public domain background. She's a one-arm dryad because her arm has been given to turn into a magical staff owned by the centaur. And yes, you can get that staff if you play your cards right. There is uh, this Harpo, who is a um, halfling thief. He has somehow projected his mind into this swarm of bees, and that's how he lives on. You can communicate with him, uh, and he will communicate back by spelling out words with the bees, but only one word at a time. There's a little example here of how that works. There's a little procedure for you. Um, I like how that's spelled out for the game master. That just makes things a bit easier. We have Melicorn, the melanistic unicorn, who is as black as Vanta Black, so just a unicorn-shaped hole in the universe. Tears and Rain, the elven twin tombs, a number of different sarcophagi that you can go through here. Um, there are a lot of traps in throughout this dungeon, and uh, one thing you'll find a whole bunch of are these rings that used to belong to the companions. And these rings are going to be really useful magic items that will help you bypass certain traps and unlock certain doors. So it's cool that there is a collectible because players really love collectibles in dungeons. There is a magical intelligent sword that will rise out of a pool of blood that you can acquire. Love to get some sentient swords. And we have level two, which includes a troll larder, an armory with a double lock door. This is a nice little mini game right here where you have to have two different keys that have to be put in and turned at the same time. You can try and bypass this by using knock or lock picks on these, but you have to do those at the same time as well, which is very difficult to get the timing right. Here's another great magical item, ice seed in a chiseled crystal file. An ice cold crystal bead leaves frost on fingers. In contact with water will freeze up to a 60 foot sphere, expanding 20 feet per round. I guess you could use that to break things open in, in certain cases. If ingested by a living creature not immune to cold, instant death. If thrown into the river, the resulting iceberg clogs its flow downstream, submerging areas 
a whole bunch of them. It takes two days to slowly melt and let the water level go back down again. So again, that's another way that players have a lot of strong control over what the environment actually looks like. You can investigate a wizard's workshop full of all sorts of weird wizardly things, like two jars of universal lubricant and a rock uh, living statues. Searing hot, nude human females with doe heads. When they animate, glowing red cracks reveal molten magma, which they shoot from their fingertips. That's pretty terrifying. There's a tunnel with 216 fey skulls, 56 of which belong to the broken souls. So if you destroy or bury those particular skulls, then you can put those uh, broken souls to rest. However, you might get cursed or you might get a boon depending on how well you treat them. There's some really great trolls right here. These are jewel heart trolls. So each of them has a different jewel in their heart. For example, the oldest, Emerson, has a pearlescent coral heart worth 6,000 gold pieces intact. Wants to eat new things, interested in new recipes and tasty looking PCs. There's an old illusion here, a crumbling courtroom where you can actually hold court with that judge, as I mentioned before. The killing ground where all of the broken souls are swirling about and can manifest themselves. An interrogation room where a lot of the elves were interrogated and tortured by the seven companions and a cell with heaps of stinking blankets, a uh, cache and a crack in the roll, you can find a scroll, and a hiding tarantella. At the back, there's an appendix with magical items. So the blue honey right here, which restores uh, hit points, but can cause addiction with all sorts of unfortunate effects for withdrawal. We have fey fruits, the different candies that you can find from that halfling thief. We have the actual grimoire of that particular wizard, including some really cool spells, like uh, this one, Kodiak Stone Trail. The caster enchants a bag of pebbles, similar in type, color, and size. He then drops them, drops them behind him as he moves, no more than three feet apart. The caster may use an action to be instantly teleported um, at the start of the pebble trail, ending the spell. And if you disrupt the trail, then you only go back as far as the disruption goes. So that's really great. It's a very useful spell for long-term travel, kind of like Mark and Recall in Morrowind, but it's very physical. So there's ways that you can mess with it in the real world. There's a very powerful magical staff here that you can acquire made out of that dryad's arm. There's sentient sword with its own agenda. We have the different signet rings and where you can find them. A list of the different fallen companions um, beyond the, just the normal seven ones. And how to run this particular trial with that judge if you want to do that. It even has designer notes at the back about how to run this dungeon and different methods that you could use. I really appreciate that. Some rival um, NPC parties that you could throw in there if you're going to do this over the course of several sessions, which you probably have to because it's a fairly large dungeon. You're going to have NPCs starting to sneak in there from the nearby village, investigating things as well. And the open game license and the encounters at the back, which we've seen. So there we have the Sepulchre of the Seven. It's a really detailed, very complete, very fleshed out dungeon. Uh, quite remarkable. I would have a lot of fun running this, and I think you probably would too if you like old school essentials. Uh, the only tricky part is making sure that your characters are high enough level to deal with it. I tend to run low level adventures and it's kind of unusual to get um, OSR characters up that high. But if you do, this would be a really great choice. As usual, links will be down in the description below for where you can check it out for yourself. And thanks for watching. See you guys next time.